Good morning. Good morning. I wasn't here last week. Some of you know that. I've had more than one person say, hey, Pastor Randy, sorry I wasn't here last week. And it's funny because like I wasn't here last week, but you didn't know that because you weren't here last week. So then we're all back. Um, it's good to be back. Pastor Billy prayed for me. Or not prayed for me. He did pray for me, but he preached in my absence. And that's super cool to have somebody who has my back in that way. So thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. You're, um, anyway, we have something coming up that, like, uh, we've, we've sort of, not sort of, uh, we, have, we have pushed all of our eggs and into this basket. And I'm about to tell you what that basket is. Um, or if you're a gambling man, like Billy is, um, you... There are some actual eggs on the table. <laughs> those are not the eggs that we're, yeah. that we're talking about. Yeah, by the way, those eggs there, like, I don't know if you, maybe you wondered, like, are those wooden eggs? Because, like, we live in that era where, like, you've got plastic fruit on your, you know, wooden eggs. Whatever. Those are actual eggs. They're there every week. I know that seems odd. They're there every week for you to take. My precious wife, Lydia, brings those as a gift to you because we have chickens, and chickens lay eggs, and they don't stop. So, anyway, those are those for you to take. That's not even the point, but those are, yeah, okay. Um, so... We've pushed all our eggs into one basket. If you're a gambling man like Billy, then you say, you say at some point when you really believe in what you've got, you say, what do you say? I'm all in. I'm all in. That's right. You say, I'm all in. And, and so uh, I have told you that I have been praying over the summer months on Tuesday nights, also on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays, and, you know, you get the point. I've been praying on Tuesday nights regarding our fall that God might in the next several months and over the course of the next year do much here at River Church. Uh, COVID has done a number on River Church like it's done a number on many churches. And yet, when I look out at who's here and, and who, is, who, who is woven into the fabric of River Church, I'm like, man, I want to be a, a part of a, of a church like this for the rest of my life. But wouldn't it be awesome if we, if we grew, if we, in fact, grew exponentially? And so um, if, if God would, now if God, if, if God wouldn't do this, but if this church grew, but it was a bunch of, I don't know, losers or whatever, people that were like mean and ugly and didn't, you know, we didn't love each other, then I wouldn't want that. But if, if God would grow a church bigger and bigger and bigger, just like what we have right now, man, I want to be a part of that. Uh, you're precious people. And, and so uh, that is that is where I believe uh, we are headed, and it is to that end that I have been praying this, this whole summer, and, and I've asked you and encouraged you to come on Tuesday nights and pray for just that, thing, just that goal, to, to that end. And so now we begin the fall uh, with um, home is here, and most specifically our back to church Sunday. Billy's going to tell you about that. Yeah, so uh, September 19th, it's going to be our uh, Back to Church Sunday. It's a, it's a big pull, big push to uh, invite friends maybe who uh, used to go to church, that maybe they don't go to church anymore. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a person who uh, you've been praying for for a long time and you've been looking for an opportunity to bring them in, to invite them. Man, that's the Sunday that we want to do that. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> We called it Home is Here, and man, we believe that. We believe that we are one big home, one big family, um, and that you can find that family. You can find your home here with us. Um, man, I love every one of you guys, and the longer that I've been here, the longer that we've been here, it just feels like this is our home. I love it. The people that I've spoken to, you guys love it. And so we just want to be able to bring other people into our home as well. And so September 19th, home is here. Invite your friends. Invite the people you've been praying for. And like Randy's saying, uh, let's get them interwoven into the fabric of River Church. Pastor Billy and Daniela have worked on th these, these cool little invites. Uh, these are for you to take home. You receive some. We'll print more. They're no good uh, in two weeks, meaning... The, the information is dated. Um, so I'm going to tell you more uh, in the sermon today. Uh, I'm going to explain to you what I'm asking of you, what I'm asking you to do, because there's some things that I would like for you to do. But September 19th 
It begins uh, not only the fall in the sense that it's our Back to Church Sunday. Uh, it begins uh, a new sermon series. Uh, it, it begins, uh, you'll hear more about this in, in, in next week, but we're going to begin, it, it will begin our Wednesday night uh, um, community night with potluck meal and, and all that. It, it's going to begin, uh, it's just, it's the beginning of our fall. And so it is to that end that we, that we push in that direction. Would you pray for us? Yeah, sure. We didn't rehearse that part. Yeah, I'll pray. Uh, Jesus, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for uh, this body, this group of people, Lord. I pray, uh, Holy Spirit, that you speak to us, uh, speak through us, Lord. I pray that you speak through Pastor Randy. Uh, I pray that our time together is both uh, enjoyable and edifying to all of us. Thank you for this time, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. One more thing before I, we jump into God's Word. If you would like to um, have oversight of our potluck dinners. That's just an old school word, but our dinners on Wednesday nights, which aren't beginning yet. It's going to be a few weeks from now that we're going to start this. If you'd like to, to, to have oversight of that, to, to lead a small team of people as we bring food or buy food or prepare food um, on Wednesday nights for us to eat as we have table groups and discussion groups, if you like, would like to oversee that um, or help with that, maybe you don't want to run it, but you want to help with that. Uh, we used to do this. During the COVID era, we didn't do it, but we're returning that. Wednesday night, table groups, and a meal. If you'd like to be a part of that, um, the, the prep of the meal, the, the, the leading of the team, then see Pastor Billy, and he'll, he'll talk to you more about it. He'll give you the details. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, it's, it's an important thing. We need some really responsible people to take on that responsibility. So that's you. See Pastor Billy. Amen. So be it. All right. Home is here. So we're getting ready for this Back to Church Sunday. And I'm asking you to consider, I'll, I'll get into the details later, but I'm asking you to consider inviting three friends, three friends to church, and then I'm inviting, and then I, 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 I'm inviting you to, to, or asking you to invite them not only to church, but then, but then have them out over for lunch or take them out to lunch. You know, if your finances permit, and some of our finances don't permit that, uh, and that, and I understand that, but, but you can certainly, all of us can invite three people. Uh, many of us can, can then have them over uh, for lunch, and some of us can even take them out for lunch on Sunday, September 19th. Lydia and I are, we're asking the same question, and we're dealing with the same awkwardness that maybe you are dealing with, because like if I invite three families, you know, one of them will say no, maybe two of them will say no, one of them may come, uh, hopefully at least one of them will come. And so, I, I mean, I live in that same world and that same tension that you do. I'm going to ask some of my fishing buddies, and that's going to be super awkward, but, but they really like me. Uh, so, so, you know, one of them maybe will come. It's on a Sunday, and they fish on Sunday, but maybe they'll come anyway. I was, I was walking and, and praying a few days ago, and I ran into somebody who I... Uh, I, I haven't really had a discussion with for probably 12 years. And this fellow didn't think that I recognized him. He actually came and heard me preach like 12 or 13 years ago, so before River Church was even in existence. And I saw him, and we had a little small talk. I asked him about his, uh, he had a new Suburban. And it was really cool of a truck, so I was talking about him. And, and, uh, and he said, you don't remember me. And I said, I said, yes, I do. I said, I don't remember your name, but I said, I, I really, as bad as I am with names, you know, George W. Bush is like really, really good with names, they say. I'm really bad with names, but I never forget a face. So it like haunts me at times, right? Because I'm like, I know this person. I just don't so anyway, I, I know who you are. And I told him things about him that I think freaked him out a little bit. I was like, I know you're this and this and you own this business. And, blah, blah, blah. You know? and, and so we talked. And, and it like really, it really, there was really this calmness to like, okay, Pastor Randy remembers me. 
And so, and again, I was like 12, 13 years ago. So um, I'm going to invite that guy to church. I know I'm going to see him again in a few days. I'm going to invite him uh, to church on, on September 19th. And it's going to go something like this. It's going to like, look, this is, this Sunday is for people that don't normally go to church. And I'd love for you to come and be my guest. And, and uh, I don't know that I'll say this exactly, but like if you, if you hate it, you never have to come again. Would you just come this one Sunday? Oh, by the way, we didn't even tell them. Uh, we, didn't, we, we didn't even tell you that there's going to be tacos at 1030 for the 11 a.m. service. Tacos at 1030 for the 11 a.m. service. So, now if you're wondering, Pastor Randy, you just said you were going to start the sermon, and now you're doing a little, in, doing a little a promo again. Actually, this is, this is the sermon. Here's why I say that. In today's Bible passage, we have a picture of Jesus. Listen to this. We have a picture of Jesus canvassing the neighborhood. In today's passage, uh, we have a picture of Jesus getting the word out that he's coming through town, that, that the big day is almost here. And I don't mean the big day, his second coming. I mean the big day like, like he's going to roll through town in a few weeks. And so he's, he's getting the word out. I am convinced, having really studied Jesus' life, I am convinced that if he were here today, he would be, he would be inviting to, to back to church Sunday. Um, he'd be sending out flyers. He'd be, he'd be promising Q tacos if, if they had Q tacos in, back, in, back in Jesus' day. Um, in today's passage, Jesus sends out a crew of 72 people to prepare, to, to, to tell people, Jesus is coming to town, get ready. And so in the same way, over the next two weeks, Pastor Billy and I, we're, we're sending you out. Like Jesus sent 72 people out to prepare the people before he got there. In the same way, Pastor Billy and I are sending you out. Next Sunday, I'm going to ask a few of you to, uh, to tell your stories. So make sure you invite somebody, because even if it like crashes and burns, like it's, a, like it's, a, it's an awkward failure, I'd like to hear your story. Because there's still success in our failure if God is in it. You'll see that in today's passage. There was, there was success in their failure at times because God was in it. So, so I, I want to hear your stories. I'd like to bring one or two of you up here on the stage. So if, if, if it goes particularly well or if it goes particularly poorly, your invite this week. Send me an email and, and I'll, I'll talk to you more about it. And then the following week, or, or um, actually it is the following, next week, the following week, we'll do that, and then the, the week after that, September 19th, back to church Sunday. Today I want to study Jesus' attitudes and his actions as he planned and as he executed this big invite. I, I'm, I'm particularly fascinated by this. We should, we should also note that that, that Jesus, at this moment in time, he had something else on his mind. I say that because that's you. That's me. Like, 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 you've got something else on your mind. Like, I don't have time to invite somebody to church, Pastor Randy. I got something else on my mind right now. I got something else, you know, in the, uh, cooking in the oven. I got, I got some, el- some other particularly large challenge going on, something else on my mind. And, and you'll see in today's passage that Jesus has something else on his mind. And yet he is able to focus on more than, than just himself. So interesting. Jesus' final moments and days and this final period of his life. Let's jump right in. Luke chapter 10. You follow along silently as I read out loud. Verse 51 is where we begin. When the days drew near for him, that is Jesus, for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. That one sentence, that one compound sentence, carries an immense amount of weight. So I'm going to unpack that for you in just a moment. 
but let me read it one more time. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him, but the people did not receive him. They did not receive Jesus. The, the people did not receive him because, again this phrase, his face was set toward Jerusalem. What does that mean? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. And when his disciples, James and John, remember them, the sons of thunder? When when his disciples, James and John, saw it, this rejection, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume these people? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, James and John. And they went on to another village. The word of the Lord, for which I give thanks. Okay, we're going to stop right there. We'll pick up uh, in verse 57. Uh, here a little bit later, but let's just unpack what we've read so far. Uh, so, so, so number one, let's talk about this. It says that Jesus' days were drawing near, and he set his face to Jerusalem. What's going on here? What's significant about that statement is that, that Jesus, it's saying that Jesus, he is very aware that his, 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 his death, his crucifixion is imminent, it is, it is quickly approaching. It will be here soon. Uh, he realizes, he, Jesus, Jesus realizes that God the Father's purpose is about to be realized in his life. Now, if you want to talk about a distraction, like if I'm Jesus, like I'm, my, my, my face is set on Jerusalem. He's headed there physically. That's what it means. But it also means that his face, that, that he's, he's headed there emotionally, like mentally. That's where he's headed. That, that's, that's the end game. So if that's me, I'm like, I don't have time for people. I, I need to be in my study praying. I need to be away from people, but not Jesus. Luke 9, I'm just going to read it. We're not going to project it. It says this. Jesus told his disciples, this is the previous chapter, he told his disciples, look, the Son of Man that, he's talking about himself. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. He knows where he's headed. What interests me about this big invite, this sending out and canvassing the villages, what, it, what interests me is that while Jesus knew he had a job to do, with every step toward Jerusalem, he is constantly in tune with the people around him. I'm, I'm often not like that. With every step toward my goal, I, I at times lose touch with people, but not Jesus. He stays in tune, full of compassion, com completely current, aware. He knows what's going on. Second thing that interests me about what we've read so far is this idea that he, he sends some ahead. And what are they doing? I think part of what's going on here culturally is they're going ahead to arrange for lodging. What do we do now? I, I hate this, but I finally bought into this. When, when I'm headed to the next town, we're traveling maybe across Texas or across country. What do we do? We get out our phone and we book a room, uh, book a hotel room, because if you get there, they're going to tell you like, well, if you would have booked online, it would have been cheaper. I guess we can, like they don't even want to give you a room, right? They're, now they want you to book Online, But back then they didn't do that. So Jesus sends, uh, he hasn't yet sent the 72 out. We're getting there. But he's sending these, his, we don't know how many, uh, of his disciples ahead, probably to arrange for lodging, also to just let them know what's going on. But there's this rejection. Let me tell you about that rejection. Jesus and his 12 closest apostles, their fishermen, they're rough and tumble sort of dudes, probably. They're probably sun-baked. Hopefully they have, they've taken a bath so they don't smell like fish. But they're just, you know, they look like fishermen. Of course they do. And they have this dialect about them. I don't have time to tell you why I know that. But if you remember, if you remember uh, 
the night before Jesus was crucified, you, you know that the Bible speaks to the fact that they had this Ga Galilean dialect. You know, fishermen sometimes have this kind of hick dialect. You know, so they had this dialect about them, even though they were speaking the same languages, they were speaking Aramaic and Koine Greek, and, but, but they had this, 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 this dialect about them. And so, so, so what the Samaritans are used to know this historically, what the Samaritans are used to is that Galileans would pilgrimage, they would come through town headed to a religious festival, um, and so it's, it his, it's just a historical fact, they would regularly reject uh, these, these pilgrims, these hick pilgrims um, that are coming through town on a religious journey to Jerusalem. And that's exactly what, what Jesus is doing right now. He's headed, uh, last time, he's headed to Jerusalem for, for the Passover. Third thing I want you to know about this passage uh, or that, I, that I want to point out as being really significant, really interesting, is that Jesus rebukes the attitude of disdain that James and John have for the unbelievers. Isn't this opposite of how we roll often? I say caution, if you have disdain for the unbeliever, in, in this case, James and John, the sons of thunder, they say, hey Jesus, they just rejected us. Right, because often when, when, when people reject Jesus, you take it personally. Like, really, it's maybe about you sometimes. I don't know. So, so they like James and John. They're they're all <clears throat> they're all worked up, and they're like, Jesus, they rejected us. They just rejected us. Can you believe that? Do you want us to call down? <laughs> it's a weird kind of faith. Like they really believe they could do this. Do you want us to call down what is a fire from heaven? You just destroy these people. And so Jesus, his his. His, um, his judgment, his, his disdain, actually isn't for those who have rejected him. It isn't for the unbeliever. His disdain is for, for James and John. In fact, if you read through the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus has no disdain in his life for the, for the, secular, for the secularist um, for the anarchist, um, for the zealot, which often in that era meant that they wanted to overthrow Rome, really, um, for, the, for the unbeliever. Jesus did not have disdain for the, those people. Jesus did not have uh, disdain for, for the morally compromised. He had nothing but compassion for those people. Even when, they, even when they doubted him or rejected him, he had nothing but compassion for them. His disdain, really, if he had disdain, it was, it was for the religious, the, the, the self-righteous. And in this case, his, his, his disdain is for his own, uh, two of his closest friends. Because, in a sense, they have given up on the unbeliever. They, they in a sense, have a hatred for the unbeliever. And Jesus says, it won't be that way. Not, not in my circle. So he rebukes Jesus, this attitude of disdain that James and John have for the unbeliever. Now I would ask you, as we can, can start thinking about inviting, how do we treat, you and I, how do we treat, how do you treat the unreceptive? The hard sell. This is like, well, I'm just going to give up on them. Go on to somebody else who, you know, maybe I'm going to find somebody who, who used to go to another church and they've taken a few weeks off and they'll, they're the easy sell. But what about the hard sell, the unreceptive? How do we treat them? Fourth thing of interest in this passage to me um, is that Jesus explains to Jane, James and John a little bit later on in the passage, but he explains that life is hard as a, as a believer, as a, as a Christ follower. He's been telling them this for three years. Life is hard if you're going to follow me. And, and, and rejection, it can be expected. It, it is woven into the fabric of who 
we are of our existence as Christ followers. Fifth, fifth thing that surprises me about this passage, and then we'll move on to the next, is that Jesus isn't panicked about the lostness of everyone around him. I mean, throughout his life, Jesus does exude this sense of urgency, but Jesus doesn't get panicked. I would, I would caution us as we, as we read the news and we consider, you know, the moral condition of society around us, I would caution us lest we become panicked as though we have some sort of role in fixing people. Jesus himself wasn't panicked about the lostness of everyone around him. He was, he was urgent regarding it, but, but never panicked. There are many who need to be evangelized. And as we go into the next passage, we're going to realize in Jesus' day, there were, there were numerous people who thought they were following Jesus, but they really hadn't a clue. Let's go on to this next passage. We'll pick up where we left off. So verse 57, verse 57, it says this. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, that is Jesus, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Catch Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes to sleep in. Birds of the air have nests to sleep in. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What an odd response. Like, I'll follow you. And he says, do you understand? I don't even have a place to lay my head. Going on, verse 59. To another, to another, Jesus said, follow me. But the, the other said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave, <clears throat> leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Verse 61. Yet another said to Jesus, he said, I will follow you, Lord. I will follow you, but, first, or, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, and I've been struggling with this statement all week as I've been studying this passage. Jesus says to this guy, no one who puts his hand to the plow, in other words, he goes to work for Jesus, puts it, and, and then looks back, is fit for the kingdom of God. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, I stop there because that's such an unsettling statement. We make Christianity and the Christian faith and following Jesus so easy these days. Man, just accept. You know, just, just, just get saved. You know, and, and then, then go on with your, you know, and whatever. And, and, but, but Jesus here, it's startling. It's troubling to me. He says, the person who, who, who sets his mind to follow Jesus puts his hand on the plow, and then looks back and thinks, yeah, but, you know, there's money to be made. Like, that, that he is unfit for the kingdom. Now, thankfully, Jesus says other words that, that we also receive that speaks of just God's grace, God's mercy, else I would never be saved. But, but the point here is Jesus is saying is, is some people who, who say they follow me don't really have a clue. Okay, so, what's going on here? They, they, they're going on to another village, and many people think they're ready to follow Jesus, and many people think that their motives are pure, and, 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 and many people think that, that, they're, uh, that they have faith, and Jesus, Jesus, in a very cryptic way, he's like, you know, I have a place to sleep, and you want to follow me? Are you sure you want to follow me? And there's no time for distractions if you're going to follow me. Are you sure you want to follow me? Of faith. What is faith? Following Christ. Putting our faith in, in Jesus. Saying, I am a Christ follower. Dr. Tony Evans, um, awesome pastor in Dallas, Texas. He, 
He says this. He says, faith isn't merely feeling like God is telling the truth, like giving mental assent, yeah, what God says, nor is it saying God is telling the truth, like getting up and preaching it, you know, and telling your family, like, this is what God, for faith is truly, uh, for faith to truly be faith, it involves acting like God is telling the truth. That's why the Bible calls it walking by faith, not talking by faith, or even, even feeling by faith. Jesus says, you're going to follow me? Come on. Don't look back. Jesus says, you're going you're gonna to follow me? Come on. We got work to do. Do we struggle with this? Thinking that my, my head says I have faith and my lifestyle, it says other. My, you know, I, have, I give mental assent to Jesus, but my actions say otherwise. My fear, my resistance to the leading of the Holy Spirit in my life says I am maybe not really walking by faith. You see, see Jesus is actually esteeming his followers. He's not belittling us. Jesus is actually esteeming us because what Jesus is actually saying is is that a person's decision to follow me, it's a big deal. It's not not, not flippant or frivolous or even easy. Walking by faith, there's nothing easy about it. There's nothing, it's it's not a minor decision. That's Jesus' point. If you're going to follow me, it's a big deal. In fact, it's such a big deal that Jesus encourages us to consider the cost of following me. That's so unlike pop culture, where it'd be like, the more the merrier, come on. Even if you're not really committed, let's all jump on the bandwagon and let's do this together. In contrast, Jesus actually cautions people. Consider the cost. Take it seriously. Don't put your hand to the plow and then look back. That will not work. This is a real contrast to how we often describe the life of a Christian today. We, we mostly consider, you know, if, if I, am I going to go to a church, will it serve me best? And, and, and Jesus, his calling in a person's life is quite the contrast. It's not of, will it serve me well, but am I ready to serve, to follow, to be a disciple? Next surprising thing about this passage, um, very similar to what I just said, is that, that Jesus emphasizes Jesus emphasizes that being a follower, not only is it inconvenient, not only is it hard, it is costly. It will cost you something. I think that's why Jesus points out, like, I, I, don't, I don't have a, a permanent residence. Like, I'm that kind of, he was called a rabbi. I'm that kind of a rabbi. I don't even have a residence. Are you sure you want to follow me? And I think that's why he gets into this whole, like, plowing and looking back. He's talking about commerce. He's talking about industry, and he's talking about wealth, where you live, where you lay your head to rest. And Jesus says, the Son of Man doesn't even have a place. The the clear point is, Jesus' followers must be prepared for the same sort of of, of lifestyle, of treatment, that it's, it's going to be costly. It's going to be a big commitment. Let's move on to the last passage today, and that is starting with chapter 10. says this, after this, the Lord, and here's, the, here's, the, here's where I, what I've been talking about. After this, the Lord Jesus appointed 72 others, and he sent them on ahead of him, two by two, in every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, And here's where we're going to kind of land the plane today. Here's maybe the most important. If you haven't heard anything else, hear this. And Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful. What's he talking about? He's talking about people. 
The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And he says, go your way to the 72. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. The word of the Lord, for which I give thanks. Okay. What surprises me about this last section, one is, and in some ways perhaps it's no surprise, but in another way I think it is refreshing to realize that Jesus himself believes in evangelism. Jesus himself, he, he, he'd, he'd, he'd do well, he'd do well to lead like the old school, I, I told you about this in the past, like in my, in my background growing up in the church, this old school, like Tuesday nights was visitation night. And you'd send people out two by two, and they'd come knocking on the doors and be like, you know, hey, you came and visited church. You want to know more? You know, or, or you, you want to know how to be saved? You know, like Jesus would have, good, would have done a good job of running that ministry because he really believes in going out and knocking on doors and inviting and sending people in pairs. And, um, but Jesus believed in evangelism. Any, any misunderstanding that would say that Jesus wouldn't wouldn't want us to, to actually be a little awkward and invite people to church and tell them, about, like, that's just not true. That's exactly what Jesus would, he'd be all about that. He'd be all about back to church Sunday. He sends 72 out, uh, 72 of his followers out in, into the surrounding villages, the surrounding towns, pr- to, to prepare them for his visit, to prepare them for his message Finally, the most striking part of this, this passage is, is actually verses 2 and 3. So, first of all, Jesus, Jesus perhaps, perhaps his second or third most famous words that he ever spoke in the New Testament. Um, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Okay, so what is he saying? In case you haven't caught this, maybe, maybe you haven't seen this passage before, you don't, you don't understand what he's talking about. He's talking about the harvest. He's talking about people that are lost in their sins, lost spiritually. They have no relationship with Jesus. They're, they're not followers of Jesus, which in that case, in that day, was most people. But guess what? In, in our day... Most people. And so Jesus says the the harvest, and he means this in the most compassionate way, it is it is astoundingly plentiful. Like the people that do not yet know Jesus in your life, don't pretend, don't don't trick yourself into saying, like, yeah, most of my friends go to church. Then you don't have enough friends because most people don't go to church. Most people don't know Jesus. I mean, if you count every church in Brownsville and you add up how many people go to those churches, I'm telling you still, the vast majority of people today in Brownsville are at home. More importantly, they don't know Jesus. Jesus says the, 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 the harvest is plentiful. And the next thing he says is the laborers are few. In other words, we send out 72 people. That's not a whole lot of people considering there are tens of thousands of people that don't know Jesus. The, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. And then, and then I would think he would, like, that makes me really nervous. I'm like, oh, my gosh, we, like, how are we ever going to do that? Because, like, we're so little and they're so big. But Jesus doesn't panic. Jesus doesn't say the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, so get to work. It may feel like that's what I'm saying, because I do panic every once in a while, but that's not what Jesus says. What does Jesus say? He says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And what does he say? Therefore, are you listening to me? Are you, are you following? Well, what is it? He says the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, what does he say? He says Pray. And he says, pray earnestly. And what does he say beyond that? He says, pray earnestly to whom? To 
the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. This is, this is weighty. This is significant. This is, what he is saying is, when you look at Brownsville, and you're like, there, there are so many people that don't know Jesus. And then you, and then you look at, at, at River Church in, 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 in that perspective, in that light, and you say, we are so small. She says, when you do that, your response isn't, oh my gosh, we better get busy. Good thing we brought Pastor Billy on staff. We better get busy. We got a lot of stuff to do. And, and, and he doesn't say that. What he says is, look, look to the Lord of the harvest. Put it back on God. Say, God, this is your heart. You are the Lord of the harvest. This is your, the, this is the, your fields, God. Jesus saying, pray to, 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 the God in, to your God in heaven and say, These are your, th- this is your harvest. You are the Lord of the harvest. In other words, this is on you, God. But oh, that we might, oh, that we might be, a, that we might put our hands to the plow and be a part of this. See how he's brought this first full circle? Oh, that we might be a part of this, this harvest season. He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send out, that he might send more labors. So, you know what I, I, I'll tell you a little more about what I pray every Tuesday night when I sit right there in that second or third chair and I pray. I say, Lord, Lord, this is your harvest. Would you, would you send some more laborers? Would you, would you send some new laborers? And I can tell you by name some of the people that, that God has sent in the last year and some of the people that God has sent in the last six weeks. And I would say that is, that is God beginning to answer that prayer that he would send more laborers. So in other words, we don't just pray that Brownsville would be saved, that all the lostness would be dispelled, but we pray that God would send us some more laborers. Maybe some people that quit going to church for a while, but it's time to go back. Maybe some people that are going to some jacked up churches, but they can come to River. Some people, some more laborers. God, would you send us laborers? The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers into the harvest. Jesus said the first best approach to being overwhelmed with, with all the work is you give it to God in prayer. So what are we to do? We, we pray. I'm going to give you a list in a minute, not yet, a list of what I want you to do. But th- here's a general idea of what Jesus is calling us to. What do we do? We, we pray. We, we acknowledge that, that Brownsville belongs to you, God. The, you, this, it, it's, it's your harvest. It's not ours. We're not sweaty palm to worry about it, God. This is your harvest. We ask for help in the work of ministry. We ask that you'd send us some more laborers, and we do not excuse in action by merely praying. We don't just pray. On Tuesday nights, we just pray, but, but we don't just pray. We go out. We invite. You know, verse 3, it said, Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. We're not going to get there today. In fact, it may be a while before we look at this. But you know what? Do you know what happens when Jesus finally, we read it in Matthew, when Jesus finally gets to Jerusalem? You know what he does? He, he weeps. He weeps over the lostness of Jerusalem. When is the last time you, you wept over the state of lostness of your friends, and your loved ones? Now, some of you, I know, it was just this morning. To be like Jesus is to be tender-hearted and compassionate toward the lostness of our community and our friends. Okay, to that end, to that end, here's what I'm asking you to do. You might want to take a photo of this. Wait till the last screen because it'll have all of them. You might want to take a photo with your with your camera or write it down or whatever. But this is what I'm asking you. Could you do this? Might you be able to do this? Number one. I'm asking you to join us Tuesday night here in our prayer gathering. What are we going to pray? Well, silently where you're at. And by the way, you know, we've been changing the music up here or there. We kind of moved back to playing some more hymns. So if you weren't really jiving with the music we're playing, whatever. It's hard to, it's hard to please everybody, but we've got, some, we got some, some lo-fi hymns playing quietly in the background now. So if that's, if that's your style, 
come on and pray with us. Tuesday night, what are we going to, I like lo-fi, I like that phrase. Um, some of you that really, you really jive with that. Um, what are we going to do? We're, go, we're, going to, we're going to pray specifically that the Lord of the harvest would do his work. Silently, right where you're seated, you know, where that's where we're going to be praying on Tuesday night. That's the first thing I ask you to do. Come this Tuesday night and just pray for Brownsville. The second thing I ask you to do is this. Invite three people to church two weeks from today, but you've got to start inviting them now. Third thing I ask you to do is bring your friends, those friends, at 10.30 a.m. on the 19th. Bring them for free breakfast tacos. And the last thing I ask you, there may be one more. The, number four, consider making them lunch or taking them to lunch after, um, after the service on the 19th. And that's actually, that's actually all I'm asking you to do. Write those down, take a photo. Consider the cost. I mean, there's cost in this, right? Like street cred, like awkwardness, like maybe a little money if you take them out to lunch or you make them lunch. You know, there's, there's, there's a time inconvenience. Uh, you got to come to church on the 19th if you're going to bring them. Like, there's all sorts of, so, so consider the cost. Count the cost. Jesus would say that to you today. Don't, don't just flippantly say, I'll do that, and then don't do it, right? You know, Jesus taught, it's, well, I can't preach another sermon, so I'll stop there. Um, this is what I'm invite, inviting you to do. Would you consider that? Um, I believe that God is in this, and that God is going to be moving among us this fall, over the next several months, over the next year. If, if you want to be a part of that, and, and I, I sincerely hope you do, if you want to be a part of that, then let's do this. Let's do this. Would you join me in prayer? God, we'll just begin now. God, we'll begin now. We'll, we'll pray. We'll say, you are the Lord of the harvest. We, we care about Brownsville. Not, not just Brownsville as a whole, because it's easy to care about the masses, I guess, but it's difficult to, to care for people one at a time. We each one of us, we have friends, a family member, people that are lost that we, we're sad for, that we want more for. So, so we're coming to you. You're the Lord of the harvest. We ask that you would, you would send more laborers to River Church, more people who do know you and are ready to work. And we pray that you would be the Lord of the harvest. You would you would include us in the harvesting, the saving of, of the lost in Brownsville. The, 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 as you push back the darkness in Brownsville, would you do that through, through River Church? We know you're going to do that. Would you, would you do that through River Church, God? We pray for September 19th. God, if you're in this, and we certainly believe you are, we wouldn't be doing this. God, we pray for September 19th. If you're in this, would you, would you bless that day? Would you bless our efforts? Would you... Would you ramp up, energize our, our desire to invite people? Would you, would you bring us success? And would you even work through the rejection? God, would you bless September 19th? Would you bless the fall here at River Church? Would you grow us in our relationships? Would you grow us as a church in every way, in every sense of the word, would you grow us? We're looking forward to what you're going to do, God. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.